Welcome everybody to uh, Control Systems uh, 2016. Uh, my name is Alfie Saxon. I've served as the program chair for, for this uh, track of, of SPCI convention. But I'm also going to chair this first session on, on gamification. Uh, just uh, let me say a few words about control systems. It, it is a conference that dates back, I think, to 1982. Uh, and uh, the first couple of times it was uh, held here in Stockholm, and then later on it, it has moved between Sweden, Canada, and Finland. So the last time it was here in, in Stockholm was 2010, and we were at the Fotografiska Museum. Uh, and um, then we, we didn't actually, uh, yeah, we had about the same number of people then. So. It's, it's really great to, to see so many people here, as, as you heard Marina say. Um, the general rule for the program these two days is that we have the control system sessions here, but we uh, make a break when there is a, a plenary or keynote speak uh, upstairs. So you shouldn't uh, need to miss any of, of the plenaries, and you can come back here. <clears throat> for, for control systems. So, um, without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, actually get started with the first session uh, on gamification. Uh, luckily, we had one contributed uh, presentation or, or paper on gamification. So, I'll let uh, Peter Lingman from Optimation start talking about uh, something that they have uh, work with gamification in education. So, uh, okay. please, Peter. And then we have an invited talk from, from, S, uh, uh, from SIX and from Stuart Enzo. I think the, the two speakers are, but it's a bigger project and you will talk about that later. And then hopefully we'll have some time at, at the end for, for a bit of discussion with the presenters and with Sebastian. So, please, Peter. Hmm? Thank you for the introduction. How much time do I have? It's my first question, actually. You have 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay, thank you. Yes, my name is Peter Lingman, and I work for Optimation AB. <clears throat> and today I'm representing or presenting a work that we have done in a small project consortium uh, uh, that I will come back to later on. And this work has been <clears throat> partly financed by, by Vinova and the PIA program. So it's about gamification in web-based dynamical simulations, and we made a trial in an undergraduate course in paper technology at the Luleå University of Technology. What did we do? <clears throat> well, we, we tried to introduce simulations as part of the education of any master students at LTU, <clears throat> and these were students doing their last, last year of, of studies at the chemist department. So they have been running and controlling a simulated section of a mill, which we call the game. And all the interaction has been uh, through a web browser, so it's a cloud-based solution. And we have tried to introduce some elements of gamification to this to make it more fun and more enjoyable. What did we get? A picture with happy students. These are the students that participated. I think one is missing. I think there were eight students this year at this course, uh, paper, and, uh, paper technology course. We think we might have introduced a new tool for teaching, or assisting in the teaching. Uh, this is probably the first contact with live automatic control for these uh, guys and process dynamics. I think these people, these uh, students are meant to be process engineers in the, in the paper, pulp and paper area, for example. So this is the first contact with automatic control. And of course, as tool developers, we got some feedback for, for further and future development. Uh, the project consortia has been quite small. We have university represented by LTU. We have IT represented by Softronic, who is the provider of the framework we have worked with. Uh, Optimation, automatic control SME company. And of course, financial support from, from PIA. So it's a quite small consortia. The main motivation for the work that we did was to 
to come up with a complement for, for the current education. The teachers have seen that it's very difficult to explain dynamics and, and, and uh, control systems by, by pen and paper. So, so that is the main motivation, I would say, and to get an introduction to automatic control. <clears throat> Uh, and in, or, in order to make this more uh, interesting, we, we have tried to apply some concepts of, of gamification to this uh, platform. <clears throat> and we also think that this might be a good way for, for self-studies. During these trials, we didn't really reach that point, but uh, it, it, it is for sure possible to, to do that. And of course, we, we see that uh, much of this could be transferred for, for more um, sort of industrial usage. But the focus has been on education in, at universities. Uh, and the platform that we have used sorry, uh, is called EveriSim, <coughs> which is a web-based graphical simulation provider or platform. So everything is run in the web browser. You, you make your, your process pictures, SVG pictures, you make your simulation models, we use uh, Modelica, and you uh, drag and drop them into the web browser and then you can simulate the process. And there's quite a lot of work uh, uh, in the web browser. That's where you design the, the game, so to say. That's where you put the different uh, stages of, of, of learning. And why we went with this uh, cloud solution is, of course, that it's scalable and we don't have to bother about installations at certain, certain computers at the university or such things. And, of course, you can run it on different devices. So it's kind of device independent. Uh, uh, and, of course, you have good access. Uh, the way I see it, as, at least, is that students don't work 8 to 5, they work other hours. So, access is central. Uh, <clears throat> and, of course, the maintenance, which is very important, uh, we have learned over the years, it's very good to have it centralized, so teachers can have full control of what's going on and how they are progressing and so on. And if you make updates, you, you sort of push everything to, to all the users at the same time. Uh, I also think that the slight feature in every sim platform is that it's very much a do-it-yourself approach. You, you, you make your models and pictures yourself and, and, and you can design the game and the story in the browser directly. <coughs> I just mentioned modeling. We use uh, a software library called Visa, which is uh, Modelica based, we use the Emula as solver, so this is where you do the models. And, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the, the intention is to sort of have a drag and drop uh, simulator where you can drag and drop different process sections and, and get them to, to, to simulate over time. So it's dynamical simulations. I'm sure most of you have seen it. So we I just spent one hour talking gamification and <coughs> I mean applying some. some uh, some concepts from video games is, is, is the way people seem to define gamification. For us, uh, this has meant, and also it has meant more, but this is what we managed in the project. It's just a small project. To have a sort of clear and nice presentation of the story, the, the, the story we want to tell the student, we want to keep attention and get them to think around corners. So that means we need some fast feedback, on actions they take, but we also want them to sort of get these process trade-off ideas in their head. That's a slightly longer time feedback time. It has to be tolerant to mistakes, of course, because they can control it in whatever way they want, the process section. Uh, possibility to advance to next levels. Once they completed one task, they are they, given a new one. Uh, we also integrated a questionnaire which sort of gives the possibility to teachers to, to check uh, if, the, if the story has really uh, uh, sort of transmitted what, what they want to learn to the students. So there is a questionnaire at the end of the, uh, end of the game. And of course there is a feature to, to monitor the student progress, which is very important when you talk about uh, students in the uh, academic environment. And, possibly also in, in industrial applications. Now, some of the results that we saw, of course, I mean, <clears throat> the main idea was to have a very smooth introduction of this to the students, and I think the teachers did a very good, good, good job introducing the platform, and, and it was very little effort to get it running, and the students were really sort of grasping the idea here very fast. And one of the comments we got, or several of the comments we got, was that they wanted to have 
theory first in the continuation, and after the theory pass, they would like to, to sort of play a game to, to really get the more, more understanding of, of these kind of things. So that was very positive, I think. And of course, we can see some potential form of examination for the future. Right now, it was just a part of the course, but you could, of course, put it into some sort of examination. Uh, it's interesting, and also it's, it's very, very hard to cheat in this area as a student. Uh, every solution is, is unique, since you have the time dependency. So every action you take now, the effect of that will depend on what you have done earlier, of course. Uh, and the concept is, of course, transferable to, to industry. And I don't know, new era of training, I, I don't know if that's too much to say, but for sure there is a potential to, to introduce this in a, in a much uh, broader way in, in the industry also to, to get people to understand what the process is about. Uh, and adding more gamification is, is uh, for sure a way forward. We just touched the surface right now, I would say. So, uh, I will run a small demo here. Uh, and uh, of course, if you want to try the platform, you, you can send, Joachim promised me to, uh, from Softronic, promised me to fix that for you guys. So you, the way it works is that you send your a mail to, to Joachim and then he puts up a user and you get the return email with a password and, and, and not password, but username. Yeah, okay. So, and then you can just run it and try it if you want. So, Let's see if we have internet here. I said 24-7 access. And <laughs> uh, the purpose of this uh, uh, demo is, is not to go into depth about the process. I mean, there are interesting things to discuss about the model and how it's made and so on. It's more just to show that... What? This is not counting for my 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I will log on as a user called GameOn. Now the first thing that appears on the screen here is the, some sort of a progress bar. I, I will come back to that one later, it's, it's not that important. On the left side here I, I see the different games I'm assigned. And I'm just a student now, so I'm just assigned to this particular game. Here you could have a long list of different games for, for me, depending on, on what I study. Uh, the first thing that appears on the screen here is a very small part of the refine you, you, uh, process. You see a pulp storage tank and a refiner. Here you have some input boxes. I can give the specific energy to the uh, refiner. And I can also change these um, grinding plates by changing the specific edge load in joules per meter. I can also see the, some bars representing the the composition of the pulp in terms of the unbeaten, beaten, and fines. So we've made it quite simple. On the right side here, I have some game controls. I can play it, pause it, stop it, and I can also real-time accelerate it. So one times means it's running on real-time, and I can put it to 20 times, so it will run 20 times real-time, which is very good for these kind of processes. They have long time constants. Uh, on the left side here, I have my missions. That looks like a teacher hat in, ah, you might see it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's all in Swedish. The students were Swedish speaking this year, so we, did, we, did, we decided to go with Swedish and I didn't really bother translating it. But these are the different missions that I have. And the first one is to maximize the strength of the paper. The second one is to maximize production. And the third one is also maximizing production. But there are some differences in these uh, setups. And I can, of course, expand this and see a more clear definition of what, the, what I should do and, and, and how I should go on. In this case, it tells me to vary the specific edge load, which is kind of easy in the simulator, but very hard in reality to change the plates, or hard, but it takes some time. And also to adjust the uh, uh, specific grinding energy or refining energy. And there is a clear limit. I need to uh, go above 68 newton meters per gram in, in strength of the paper. Okay, <clears throat> I'll have that. Let's see if it plays. So now we're running the the simulator in the in the cloud. So <clears throat> and I can start. I can actually move that one a little bit. I can start by 
increasing, I will just play around with this a little bit, increasing the specific energy. And I can, of course, also put up some, uh, pick up some trends here. So I can clearly get the fast feedback of what I'm doing. And that's, of course, rather similar to what you have in operator environment. So I can see the green line for here, example, is my, the strength of the paper. So it went up when I started to, to grind more here. We increase a little bit more. It takes some time because there are some buffers in the system. It went down. Oh, not good. And I will probably get in too much fine. So I will reduce the edge load, going down to one, and see what happens. Oops. Now my, my paper strength went up. It actually went up above the limit. As you see it here, I have 68.5 and the, and the target was 68. I will just move that one up there. Uh, <clears throat> and on the screen appeared a new mission for me. I can clearly see it here that this mission is marked green and, and then I go to the next part, which is about maximizing the production output from the, from the paper production part. Uh, given a certain set of boundary conditions. In this case, I have some headbox concentrations I have to have, and I have some strength of the paper I have to have. Uh, now, the process that appears on the screen has a... I just shortly mention it. You have a few buffer tanks. You have the headbox up here. You have the, the, the press section. You have the wire. And on the wire, there is a very simple... just a blue bar representing the dry line position or wet line position or whatever you want to call it. And there is a few, uh, of course, indicators of the, how the, the pulp media looks like. And you have controllers. So, for example, if I open one controller here, I get a faceplate. And this is sort of the first contact with, with, that these students have with the, fa with the, with the faceplate. And this is uh, intentionally designed in a very similar way that you find in the process industry, of course, also. You have the measurement values, you have the set point values, outputs. Uh, uh, and you have the different limitations in terms of set point and output limits. And you can also, of course, tune the controllers. These are simple PID controllers, or not simple, but they are PID controllers. So the first mission here was to, to increase production given a certain boundary condition. So I will just increase the flow. Okay, that went red. I have to put it to 2000 and nothing happens. That's because it takes a long time, so I will accelerate it a little bit more. Uh, you can see here that the production is, is slowly increasing. Uh, I will also try to... I was supposed to have 0.3 in handbox concentration here, according to the mission I had. And you can see that, well, production is increasing slowly, and the wet line is moving to the right. Uh, <clears throat> I can do all kinds of different controls here and see how it runs. I will increase the concentration at this point here. Just I don't know if that's even reasonable, but you can see that production seems to be increasing, which is, of course, uh, uh, good. But now something happened. Uh, I got red boxes here, so production terminated. And that's because my dewatering capacity is, is, uh, is not enough, of course, for this setup. And this was sort of the m mission also with this, uh, to, to, to give the students an understanding that uh, there is some, some bottlenecks in the production, you can, how they should control it in order to, to manage those bottlenecks. So <clears throat> then you have to sort of recover the production and, and go on with the next mission. Uh, this uh, was designed slightly differently, so the students can themselves choose when they feel that they are ready. There's no numerical value translate, transferring them to the next stage. So I will just uh, push here very fast. And, and I forgot, you can of course also go and see the, the different trends that you, that you have in this, uh, this part of the process. This is trends regarding pressure in the inlet, uh, or head box and so on. Uh, <coughs> okay. So I will just seems to go go nuts here. We'll just finalize the last part here, and this is the sort of questionnaire that we we just designed. So there's just it's very simple, just a set of questions, sort of broadening the view of the process, getting them to uh, sort of think what what have I really learned about this, 
And the first question is from, from step number one. What happened when the plate with the highest edge load was used? So I can just one answer. I get too much fines. Save. So th th there is sort of a, um, I didn't even talk about the third exercise, it's very similar, but there we sort of more talk about trade-offs in paper strength and, 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 uh, and beating uh, levels and so on. And <clears throat> just very shortly I will show the, the progress bar. Do I have one minute more? Two even, oh, that's good. Uh, I'm very successful, 100%. <laughs> I only have one game. This is the way the progress bar is defined right now. And as a teacher, you can go in and look when the, what the students have been doing and when they have been doing. This is the latest session I had. I can go in and I can, of course, see what I did. It took me 54 seconds to maximize the strength of the paper. It probably took a lot more for the students, or a little bit more at least. I got the value of 68.5. And I can, of course, also see the, the trends as a teacher, which, which is very important, of course, because this is sort of where I can judge what, what the students have been sort of doing and, and how they have been thinking about this, uh, uh, these optimization uh, missions that they have gotten. And I can, of course, also see the answers from the questionnaire here and, and, and later on give, give feedback to the students. So, I don't know, that was my my demo, if there is any questions. Thank you very much. Hmm? So, um, while uh, Susan and Lasse are uh, hmm? setting up here, do we have a question for Peter? No, I'm not <laughs> involved in that. I know that the university has, not the gamification, but game design program in Schleffte. One of our colleagues uh, has attended that. But no, I haven't heard about that, no. Uh, okay. Uh, it's a big thank university. <laughs> thank you very much. You'll come back uh, yeah. on stage when we have the discussion later oh. on. I think we, in, uh, okay. <laughs> I should just. Schedule your last thing. I wanted to hand over this to you. So. Ah, to me. I'm sorry. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so uh, then uh, up on stage we have Susanne Timsjö. Uh, now from the Swedish Institute of Computer Science and uh, Pia, she poses industrial IT and automation, and uh, Lasse Aspelin from Stora Enso. Oh, so, yeah. So <laughs> please come up, both oh. of you, and I think Susanne will start uh, presenting. Is that so? Yeah, we do it together, yeah. so yeah. I guess okay. Lasse should be here as well. So they are going to tell us about a project uh, that's just in the starting phase and um, where, where also Sebastian Deterding is, is, one, is going to be one of the participants in the project. So that, uh, that was uh, the original connection that uh, made it possible for us to, to invite Sebastian here. So, please, Susan. Thank you, Alf. Great to be here. And yeah, Sebastian has been involved in the project as an expert in gamification. Um, so, uh, yeah, the title of this, uh, this uh, presentation is Implementation of Gamification at Storens och Skutskär Bruk, or Palpen Mill. Um, so, um, first some, uh, what do you say, introduction to what I'm working with. So, as you said, Alf, my name is Susanne Timsjö. I have been working for ABB for a long time. Usually I say I've grown up in the industry, I've grown up with software. Uh, now I'm working for PIA, and what PIA is, it's uh, an organization that is funded by uh, Vinova, Energimyndigheten and Formas. And uh, it gives an opportunity for process industry to get funding for staying ahead 
to, to be competitive in the future, to not become this lazy cat drinking uh, a Bud Light, to not get beaten of uh, smaller cats that are, have higher speed, and uh, to not become this closed down uh, factory, but to be able for process industry to take the step when we have this digital transformation. So PIA is a strategic innovation program. But now to the goal of this presentation. And Lasse, maybe you sh should say a few words about yourself before we start as well. <coughs> yes, uh, uh, my name is Lasse Aspelin. I work at Stora Enso Skut Mill, and uh, at the moment I'm managing the debarking, the digesters and the bleach plants. And uh, I've been working there for 15 years now, and main, most of the time I've been working with the digesters as a production engineer. So great, so we will uh, take you through these 20 minutes together. Uh, but then, uh, so the goal of this presentation is that you will understand what we are doing in this pre-study. And that you also understand what gamification is about. And Sebastian have given you a, like a tremendous show first, so I think you know what gamification is. But to really experience it, uh, we have tried to gamify also this presentation. So we will have like a bit of a competition here. So, Usually I want to compete women against men, so how many women do we have here? Ah, this is super bad. So next year we'll aim for 50-50% women and, and men. So instead of competing men against women, I would suggest that we have three teams. So you are one team, okay? You feel connected? Yeah, so you are the first team, so you will re be represented by this yellow car. And then we have the middle team, so you are the pink team. Okay, so I put you here, and then we have the last team here, the blue team. So what you need to do during this presentation is that you will take your car from this spot to this spot. And how you do that is by asking question when I have a question mark. So you are measured on the number of interactions you have with me. You will get immediate feedback from me when I move the notes, and you get to see the progress and where you are in this competition. Okay? Crystal clear? Okay? Interactions are encouraged. So now we enter the first level. The presentation is based on three levels. So the first level, what you now will learn, is the industry relevance to gamification. So, of course, Lasse will talk about this taking his experiences <coughs> from Skutskär. Just a short presentation of what Skutskär pulp mill is. is uh, we are situated just outside Gävle. Uh, we produce both softwood, hardwood, and uh, part of the softwood is the fluff pulp. Uh, so we have three lines, four drying machines. And for use, you who don't know it, <coughs> we call it now Supreme. It's the softwood that uh, goes to Fors for making boxes, it goes to Kvarnsveden for making the paper. We have the birch line, it's called Select. We use also in Fors, Skogal, uh, to, to the board. And then we have the Care in Storenso family of products. It's uh, the flap pulp that we use for, uh, not we, but we sell it for them who do diapers and fem cares and uh, cloths and so on, tablecloths. Uh, and we are the biggest uh, fluff producer in Europe, otherwise it's America that's the big part of fluff production. And uh, next one. Uh, <clears throat> this is how it looks like in the maneuver room up in the digester department. Uh, and uh, if you average out 90% of the time you spend there as operator, you, you sit by the DCS checking the figures and check how the production is running. And maybe 10% it's you're out on the field. Uh, on ordinary day, taking samples, check for the machinery, listen to it. And uh, maybe the rest of the time when something is broken, you have to run out and fix it, empty it, uh, fix it up for the maintenance department. And, <clears throat> and the main thing that uh, you always get when you're passing by and so on is the feedback. Uh, we always uh, are very slow on giving, uh, or bad on giving, uh, positive feedback. We always come there when something is wrong and ask for it, and why did it happen, and so on. And so when you ask around with the operator, it's always more feedback, more feedback. Could you give us both good and bad? And uh, in this maneuver room that we have uh, started to work with, with this project, is, uh, we are five operators working here. And just this picture, just to show a little bit how, how we're organized. We have three digesters and one bleach plant in this maneuver room. Maneuver room. So one operator is, is, uh, is uh, running, one digester, one is the second and third. 
and um, we are really, really slimmed, so one operator, he has the responsibility to, all the way from the chip screening that's situated two, three hundred meters away from the maneuver room, to the digester, brown stock washing, oxygen stage, to the storage tower before the bleach plant. So it's a wide uh, range of uh, machinery that they are responsible and running. The bleach plant is from the storage tower, the whole bleach plant, and to the next storage tower. And then we have the fifth person that we call the runner, or the one that's out on the field. So something gets wrong, you have the radio and you can or, um, maneuver him out or her to, to check for what problem it is, or if everything is stable, you go out cleaning or take samples that you have to do. Uh, we work all day around, six shift, and um, uh, just the two last years we have organized the maneuver room, what you can't really see in the picture, that we are sitting in a in a circle. Before, we were sitting in a long line, so just by doing it in a circle was really positive to get the operators to work more together. And the next one is, <clears throat> when we heard about this in, in January or late December, about this game, gamification project, we started to think, what is it? Uh, myself, I didn't understand a thing. I don't play video games, and uh, the operators here are between 25 to up to 60 years old. And uh, <clears throat> we got some information, what could gamification do for us? So we sat on our maneuver room and started discussing the operators, and the old one was not so interested, and the younger ones that plays a little bit of video games were quite eager to, to come up with ideas. <clears throat> but what we discussed what is, uh, was, was, uh, was that uh, it's a lot of lone man's work in the mill. You often do things by yourselves. You sit there and run your digester, then you go out in the mill, but you're all alone. It's not so often that you go out two or three persons. So could we do anything, or could we use this to get better safety in the mill? Could we use this technology to, to keep it safer? Uh, things that we were discussing a bit was, can we use cameras, interactive TV, and so on, to, to not be... Uh, not have to go out to the mill to check for some stuff. Uh, they got put on goggles or something just to see it in the room. A um, lot of other stuff was coming up with this routine works that you do that maybe we are not so good in visual, uh, visualization of, of the results to see what the operator before has done, what you have done, and what the next should do. And uh, we just put in the figures into these uh, systems, and then if you're interested, you check for them. And uh, one thing that you brought up also in the beginning, can we use this to try to solve problems? Because if you're in the mill, the same problem, it could take five years until it comes the next time. So it takes time to figure out what, what did we last time and what should we do this time? Could we use this to try to, in some way, to, to uh, have the system to uh, ask the right questions, to come up with ideas of what did we do the last time to, to fix the problem? And uh, uh, those were the questions from our side. And uh, I believe that one thing that when you hear the Sebastian uh, talking up there is just the part that we have been discussing at the end of it is the feedback of it. How to get feedback from this system to make this work much more interesting. Because uh, the guys or girls that are 10 to 15 years old now, they will be 20, 25 in 10 years time and then will, they will be the new operators. And how should we do to try to, to get them to feel, uh, think that this is funny? Because on a good day, maybe you do one click on the mouse button an hour. Then you just look at the picture. So it's not so much that you are working with the process if it goes stable. Yes? Yeah. Great. So now your turn. So um, how many, I mean, what do you usually do as an operator? What is this? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Yeah? It goes quite automated. Yeah? Any more comment? How many operators are usually working in a shift team at Stora Ense Skutskär? Five. Where did I hear five? Here. Yeah, we have a leading team. Or two leading teams. <laughs> okay. And how many shifts are they running? Usually it's two. Six, yes. Yes. Clear leader. 
So now we are entering now level two. So level one has been quite easy, hasn't it? You have now practiced a bit what to do. So now you're encouraged also to have interactions during the presentation, not only when I put out the question mark. If you look at Super Mario in the first level, he's, uh, he's mainly practicing, you're practicing Super Mario jumping. In level two, you are practicing jumping and shooting in the same time in a bit complex, what do you say, like, uh, yeah, you combine the two different uh, mechanics. Uh, so now I want you to um, uh, also interact with me during the presentation. So we will now enter the level two. And now I will talk about this PIA project we are running. Uh, so what is gamification? I think you have heard about this several times, and Sebastian gave a really good introduction to the topic. So it's the process of using game thinking and mechanics to engage users. And uh, we have also seen, as Sebastian showed studies about that there are studies that show that many of us are not engaged at work. But if we are engaged at work, we, do a much, we are much more productive. We have a much more successful company. And then what motivates people? It's fun, growth and recognition. And those are, what do you say, like key elements within computer games. And, and couldn't we just apply them into our industry to have more successful company and, and uh, happier people? And then I will take you back before we go into uh, uh, what we have done in the pre-study. And this is uh, a study we did at ABB in 2010, where we were going around visiting uh, a lot of control rooms. And uh, I've worked in the field of user experience. And what we usually do in the first step is that we're out in the field, we're doing interviews, and we then develop personas, like fictive descriptions of typical operators, in this case, working in a control room. And what we saw was typically three types of operators working together. We had Tom, the most senior guy, um, usually had worked in the company for 25 years, working a lot in the field for 15 years as a field operator, knew everything from the mechanics to the electrical systems, and now he has entered the control room, sitting and doing the daily monitoring. Usually also doing much more, what do you say, preventive work to make the process go much more efficient and, and optimal. Uh, so, so doing a lot of analysis. And then we had Kumar, also a very experienced operator, experienced from field, working in the company for 15 to 20 years. And now what we saw uh, in these studies was that we had this new kind of operator getting into the control room, an operator that started usually directly from high school. Uh, it was very common that this new operator started a summer working worker during high school. Usually he had also his parents working in the company, started a summer worker, but then uh, being a control room operator from day one. Uh, and he had a complete different experience from the other two. And he was also a bit in... Um, yeah, he was not really... He was very dependent on the more experienced. And uh, his main comment was, it's a lot of waiting, we don't have much to do. And then if we connect what he's doing in the free time, so Nick has an APM of 220. Do you know what APM stands for? So actions per minute. So uh, Nick was used to have at home, his actions per minute is 20, 220. At work, it is yeah, 0 0.1 maybe. So it's a lot of, uh, it's not... What I'm saying is not to turn the industry into a computer game where you will sit like this, but it's a, a big difference. So what can Nick do while it's a lot of waiting? What can make him motivated? What can, can't we provide more fun things to do? Yeah. Isn't this part of the experience that Tom yes. knows everything, he has all the information about everything, so he's not actually doing anything for a minute, but he's thinking about it. Yeah. Yes. Mm. What you say, actions per minute is maybe 250 as well during work, and that's why it's so so uh, good. So he likes it so much. It's easy. It's yeah. Easy. Yeah, it could be. I mean, Tom does more, uh, what do you say, preventive analysis and so on. Absolutely. Uh, number of clicks, I'm not. I'm not sure. But we, we at least started this pre-study. And this pre-study uh, was initiated by Find It. Do we have Find It here? Raise your hand, Britta. Yes. So now at least we have some jump ahead here. 
<laughs> so Britta from Find It, you initiated this pre-study and it's funded by PIA. So what we want to look at here is we have an industrial case. Can we apply gamification to create a higher engagement by uh, um, um, at the uh, uh, higher user engagement and motivation? So in this project we have uh, HiQ, where we have Orakel Ola in the project. Uh, he is like Sweden's gamification expert, and we have Jan. Are you here? Yeah, you get some points for just raising your hand. <laughs> or what's this? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you have developed also some parts of this, so probably I will uh, ask you some questions. <laughs> so, uh, Jan Bidner comes from Society. Uh, we have Tension in the project. Tension is a game developing company, and we have Sandvik. Any from, anybody, no, anybody from Sandvik here? No? And the Stora Enzo. And ABB, of course, and we have people from ABB here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, left side. Points to you. Okay, and then when... Yeah, super. And so uh, what I realized when we started to work with this gamification topic, which I think is quite interesting, is that it is quite many disciplines within a gamification, and also many different opinions what gamification is about. You have gamification on research, uh, gamification research on one side, which talk about the methods behind gamification, how do you develop a game, what kind of processes can you use, uh, what is motivating users. And then you have the evangelist that thinks that gamification can save the world. Uh, by game, putting gamification on anything, you make it fun and you can, you can actually save the real world problems. So one of my favorite is Jane McGonagall. So if you Google Jane McGonagall, you can find a lot of interesting talks from her. And she actually has a a goal to win the Nobel Prize in peace. So that shows a bit of what the evangelist. And then you have the game developers, which thinks that the game re gamification research and the gamification evangelist talks nonsense. They are just talking and talking. The game developers have been developing games. They know what it is about. And uh, yeah, they are the, actually the ones that do it. And then you have user experience that I'm from, that thinks that gamification is just one part of user experience that focus a lot about on the uh, what is it, experience part of user experience. Uh, but then, if you look at computer games, what are they so super good at? And what are game developers really good at? And that is developing applications that perfectly match the experience and knowledge that the user actually have. They are perfectly designed to keep the people within this flow channel. Not developing a computer game that makes them bored and you don't want to play it. Not too stressful, not giving you too, too high, too, too difficult challenges that you cannot manage. They keep the players within this flow channel to constantly develop their competence. Uh, in this project, we have worked according to this method. So we have been out a lot at, Sku at, at Skutskjörsbruk. Two minutes, Alf. Yes. Well, oh. Actually, one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we have been uh, out at Skutskjörsbruk, and all of us that have been at Skutskjörsbruk, I think the comment we have had is that we want to work at Skutskjörsbruk. Mm. It's like a super good environment there. Uh, the operators are engaged, they have a great team spirit, and really love their work. Uh, so, if you're looking for a job as an operator, or uh, yeah, just go to Skutskjörsbruk. I'm trying to convince Lasse that I will do my summer work there. Mm. Uh, but then what we have developed, you saw the personas, but in gamification um, there is, you do work also with player types, which describes more the personalities of these personas and what motivates these different personalities. So Jan, you have developed these different player types. Do you have any comments about them? Yeah. That made the user types. Uh, I will not go into that much further, but it will be interesting because it comes back to the later as well. Yeah. So, so we developed this. So to give an example, so the achievers want to tick off lists. They want to organize things. And then you have the creative, for example. They want to, to, to solve puzzles. They want to, uh, uh, for example, they are very eager to change process graphics. Uh, and do things like that. So we tried to describe the operators in the control room with these player types, and then looking into how can we develop 
these player types are then motivated by different things. So how could we then, if we want to motivate uh, the achievers, for example, how could we then build motivating applications? And then I will just jump you through these. So we have gotten help from Sebastian Dieterding with a workshop to design solutions for these industrial problems. <laughs> and this describes the method we used. I will not go into detail in this. Uh, but I will show you some examples. So this is the, um, one of the um, um, concepts that we developed on, on one of the workshops, and we call it the sample runner. We wanted to do the, uh, the, the work that you do, the routine work you do at field more fun. So how could we do that? So we introduced a, a virtual coin what do you say? Virtual valuta. Currency. currency, so virtual currency. So to encourage the operators to go out on field and to take samples. And before they go out on field to take samples, they also have a challenge to guess uh, how, uh, what value would this sample have. Uh, will I manage today without writing a work order on this, uh, on this challenge? And also the, uh, the currency or the, or the value they get from taking these samples uh, depends. So if there is something that you haven't taken a sample on, the, the, uh, the value of that goes up the longer time they wait. Uh, just to encourage the operator to go out there and take the sample. And of course they then directly also gets the immediate feedback on the value they have uh, collected through taking this uh, sample. So that is very short what we have done. So now to the next level. And I mean, this is now the, the last level. So then you are, uh, I want to have your reflection without even asking some question. So. Can we do that in uh, and bringing Sebastian up here as well? <laughs> yeah. Combine that with uh, the discussion. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, Peter, would you please come up here as well? Yeah, Jan. One word. Sure. Yeah. Swiss podcast for gamification <coughs> Vienna. So if anyone wants to share any comments on this day and this gamification <laughs> track with me, <laughs> notice me, <laughs> yeah, so, so you know why I'm, why I'm sticking a microphone in the face. Oh, great. Oh, any more reflection? I would like to ask uh, Sebastian if he has any reflections uh, first on these two uh, presentations, and then I'd leave... Uh, the floor open to, to others. And I would like to ask you if uh, I can get your permission to steal a little bit of your lunch time, like five minutes, so that we have uh, about 12 minutes for discussion here. Please, Sebastian. Sure. Um, so we were actually talking about this at the, at the back of the room, right? An interesting bit about operating rooms and control rooms and things like that is uh, that it's actually, if you know things, if you understand how the whole system works, and if you understand it's a very complex system, it is actually deeply engrossing and challenging and engaging. But for that, you have to know and understand that whole system, right? There are games where there are lots of actions per second, right? Which is real-time strategy games or shooter games, etc. But likewise, we have games like Civilization, or we have chess and poker, right? Which are strategy games, which are games where poker is also a betting game, but strategy games where, where the fun is in thinking long and hard before you make certain decisions, or even probing things to see whether your hypothesis is right, whether, whether the other player is bluffing or not, or whether my theory about why the factory gives me uh, the results that I see right now are right or not. But what you need in order for that thing to be fun and engaging for you is you need to have the basic information, a mental model of the system in order to in order to be even able to engage in that kind of puzzle solving, right? Imagine I would take anybody of you or the audience, put them in front of the screen and say, well, figure out why this machine is not working, right? You would say, I don't even know where to start. I don't know how to read it. So I think there is an interesting connection between the two because basically what you're doing with a training game, which is a very classic simulation training game, uh, pretty established actually as a kind of model, is to give people that kind of literacy such that when they are in the operating room, uh, they have the ability to read the system in that manner and then get engaged in it. So I would say one of the interesting challenges that we also addressed in the workshop is how can you use that idle time, right? that long idle time where everything is running well, 
to increase people's literacy of the system and to increase knowledge sharing between the very senior operators and the very junior operators so that the junior operators start seeing and then get interested in the kind of puzzle solving of, of why are different processes running well or not well. Thank you, Sebastian. So, anyone, question? We, we have discussed it when we switched to new DCS and so on, but it's, if you should do it, you do a small part of it because it's so long line and to have it in real time and so on. So it's more like learning by sitting by the older operators. Would it be possible to uh, develop something similar to what uh, Peter showed? So that yeah, they yeah, could yes, play around with the model while, while there is idle time with the real process? I think that's what we have discussed, just to do small parts, a tank, a pump, etc., just to follow, uh, you know, the automation loop to try to get that. But it's really hard because a lot of problems are also different every time. But to know the basic automation stuff, that, that I think it's, it's, uh, it should work. More questions? How do you think about that? What I mean about that is that process understanding that it's a wider perspective, then I understand what is happening. Mm -hmm. You just have an operator training, then you are in the point where you build something thing without the basic understanding. Have you made a switch to the thing? Maybe we are changing the switch because <clears throat> it's always been like that. And when you get a new operator, he, get, he learns by sitting by the older ones. And you sort out the good ones to learn up. And, but then after a while, he gets retired and so on. So at the moment, we have hired a lot of new operators because of lots of retirement. So it's a shift between old and, and, uh, and young people. And, uh, and we feel that when we're taking in, it's not everyone has that basic knowledge about the process, how it should be working. So that is, it takes a gap, uh, a step to, to, to get that knowledge before you start to run it. So that, yeah, I believe that is something that we are seeing at the moment, that we are missing that gap, the process understanding. And it's not so many process uh, gymnasiums, uh, schools anymore that focusing. Uh, one person in, in whole Gävle was going through uh, last year for, um, for the pulp and paper industry in that process uh, gymnasium class. So it's, it's not so many of them out there that have that as a background. I would also say there's a general shift, A, in how we understand what learning is, which traditionally has been very behaviorist, so it's just learning routines. If X happens, then do Y, versus to say, no, no, a lot of learning actually involves constructing your own mental model about how something in the environment works. And some of our skills are just learning routinely, right, how to swing, how to swing a bat in the right way. But particularly in these kind of contexts, more and more of the skills that we need to have is this kind of you say process understanding, other people would say systems thinking. And one of the, one of the findings that we see in, in, in the research literature is that games, because they were effectively systems, simplified, well-designed, uh, easily controllable systems, is that even if people don't learn the process in and of itself, uh, playing games, say complex strategy board games or stuff like that, tra trains your basic capacity to view something as a system. So to have a certain kind of base process understanding. So I would say it would be super useful if they go through an, a, a focused gymnasium, but there might be some transferable skills as well. If you say, well, if you just learn to play strategy games well, in the same way that we see, say, in uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing games where you have to coordinate activity between people <coughs> for sometimes 40 people over eight hours in a real time uh, set up uh, across the globe just through headphones and the screen. Um, in the same way that that does train leadership skills that are transferable to a certain extent. You can say there might be areas where just playing strategy games and then reflecting upon them, turning them into an actual learning experience, can then give you that kind of process understanding. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. Uh, what you presented here was more to do with the daily operation of the process. But when it comes to operator training using simulators, uh, is 
there any use of virtual reality or, you know, you mentioned about IoT in the morning. Uh, is there any use of virtual reality, say, for, you know, uh, training the operators to face abnormal situations in the process or, you know, simulate the, the, the trip to the field area and, you know, find out which uh, particular motor has failed or, you know, some kind of abnormal situation. So is there, I mean, not in this project, but overall, has, has there been any efforts of integrating this with uh, virtual reality? I, I actually think that there, I mean, Anders, are you here? In code, th this project, doesn't they work with virtual reality and augmented reality trying to uh, get operators to actually practice with those technology on specific uh, like industrial problems? So I think there are work ongoing and in the PIA program. I mean, there is a lot of tradition operated mm. training platforms where, <coughs> where you sort of set up scenarios and inject faults and get operators to, to train, of course. I mean, that, that are more connected to the control systems. <coughs> the question is always with all media is why do you use that? Mm. So do you use virtual reality just because it's a novelty gimmick and it actually makes mm. things more difficult because authentic <coughs> learning, if you can already set up a panic scenario in the actual control room with mm. people running around frantically, that's the most authentic context you get. So why do I have to simulate that with everybody wearing goggles yeah. around? Whereas in certain other situations, say I, I mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder, Right, where I say, okay, I want to slowly desensitize people to certain stimuli like a spider, then to say, okay, I will first present them a virtual spider and I can, I can very fine-grained control how close that appears to you. Mm. That's a context where virtual reality might make sense. So uh, th there are instances, but I would always, th the first question is, what are we trying to achieve? And in that case, is the technology a gimmick or actually uh, mm. uh, the best mm. way to deliver whatever we're interested in? Mm. But I believe when we started to, Spawn in Swedish when we're starting to come up with ideas and you talked about uh, different stuff in from games and so on We a little bit discussed about this by maybe using a Virtual world world when you go out to to existing pump or so and you get information What to do when you're new open that valve close that one etc. Et so that's one thing that we have been discussing and uh, we, we see what happens with it, but mm. it could be a good thing to have when you are new operators to be 100% sure that you open and close the right valves mm. and empty mm. it and so on. Mm. Okay. that uh, at least in Gävle, if you, you're putting out the operator's job, you maybe get 100 appliance, but when you sort it down, maybe it's 5 to 10 that you feel that you want to interview and so on and find the right uh, background and so on. What we have done now try to, to go to other companies that unfortunately they had to close down and check for the good operators that uh, a couple of, in the 30s or so on, so they have some experience, but then we want sort of blend of it. And... Uh, it's, um, it's um, uh, since it takes a long time to be a good operator in the digest room, you used to say it takes five to six years, maybe we say three to four years now to be a good one, because uh, it's so random, uh, seldomly that we have some troubles. Then it's really hard to pick the right one in the beginning, because it takes a while to, show, to know if you are going to be a good one or, or not and to do the right pick in the beginning of it. And sometimes we succeed and sometimes we don't. So uh, uh, it's really hard to, to find the good ones. And, and one thing that we are, uh, it used to be like that. I mean, if you come to the mill, you maybe start up with the drying machines, work to the bleach plant, and when you come to digester or uh, recovery boilers, you are the top. You don't go, get any further and they stay to retirement. But what we see now is people is, is uh, moving around much more. Maybe you come and work for five to ten years, then we believe that you're a good operator, then you go to the competitor or to some other thing. So, so we need to think uh, differently with training and quicker come into it. 
but um, since uh, problems come so seldomly, it's hard to to train everyone. Mm. Uh, we have this uh, a couple of years ago. We maybe once a week we have to shut down the digester to fix something. Maybe now it goes three weeks between shut it down. So it could take half a year until the operator, if you are in the wrong shift, so say, to even to try it and uh, and learn it, because a lot of it is learning by doing. So. Which is an argument for simulation, because that, mm. that's the same for, say, fire workers, for policemen, for if you have plane crashes or all that. You say that happens hopefully very rarely, and if it happens, I want you to be top-notch. I don't want to find out that you're, that you're a dud at the point when that happens. So in all of these industries, it's one of the reasons why you would work with something like simulations that are as authentic as possible mm. in order to have that learning experience based mm. on past cases that you record and see how do people behave in those kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, final question. Thank you. Uh, just, just to say, trying to mention that uh, in one of the early workshops we did, we, we did the, this uh, blow up the factory simulation, like kind of game to, to mess it up. So, so the opposite to try to fix it, like in the paper. But we've been there, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, to thank the uh, Presenters, the audience. Uh, now we didn't really keep track of your scores yeah, of here. Of course, you, I you did. did. <laughs> okay, right. So we <laughs> have a winner. Yeah, the blue team. <laughs> the blue team. Uh, okay. Um, so thank you for this first session. I have one announcement or comment. Orke Hanson, can you stand up, please? Orke will be the chairman of the the afternoon session. I would like the presenters, the speakers this afternoon immediately to come up to Orca because you need to download your presentations. So uh, the rest of you are free to go to lunch. So thank you very much for, for this session and see you this afternoon.